Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit worldafropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. Worldafropedia.com. A firefighter in New York is facing arson charges after he allegedly set his own home on fire and then proceeded to frame Black Lives Matter as the perpetrators. So a family member said at the time that they believe their home was targeted because of the Blue Lives Matter flag flying out in front. So they have a flag flying out in front and so they thought, okay, well, someone set our house on fire. I mean, none of us did it. Um, he had his family members in the house while he did this, okay, risking their lives. Fired before he officially started. Last Monday, 41-year-old Robert Pattison went to introduce himself to his fellow firefighters at Engine 55 at Joy and Southfield in Detroit. 2nd Battalion Chief Sean McCarty calls it a tradition for firefighters. It's not mandatory, it's voluntary. You come in, you bear in, bear in gifts, you, uh, you might bring some nuts. The usual gift is donuts, okay? Um, but you're allowed to bring in whatever you want to bring in. And Pattison, a probationary firefighter, decided to bring this watermelon with a pink ribbon on top. We're told some African-American firefighters were instantly offended since 90% of the people who work at Engine 55 are black. I thought it was a black white thing. You know, I hate to say it and I hate to call a spade a spade, but as the children say, it is what it is, you know, and it's the truth. I felt like it was a, it was a racial thing. Stacy Claiborne is a full-time nurse and a mom of Deshaun Trippy. She was driving on Johnson Road last week when he had his most recent. I was like two seconds from the firehouse, go to the firehouse. I tell my oldest son, say, hey, take this glove, go to the firehouse, ask the fireman to get you some ice in his gloves so I can get on your brother's nose so I can get his nose beat under control. Claiborne says a firefighter turns him away. So my son comes back and says, um, the fireman told me I can't get in the ice, it's for their personal use. Well, Josh, the fire chief tells me that racist remarks like the one you're about to hear about have to be dealt with quickly, especially because when it's time to do their job, there's no room for discrimination. A three-sentence statement was all it took to get Ryan Hudson fired, but those small sentences were loaded with vulgar and inappropriate language that could only be described as racist. The woman who those comments were allegedly directed at didn't want to be identified. She told Fox 17 this all started after she commented on a status about Colin Kaepernick taking a knee during the national anthem. She says she agrees with his right to do so and says it was that comment that led to a back and forth with Hudson. Then he decided to call me a a who um, um, kicked his ass and all kinds of other stuff. Oh, that I should go back to the field yeah. from whence he saved me from. Nowhere are you a public servant and you're in a public forum speaking like this. We just got our hands on the incident report regarding this issue of what happened behind me at Fire Station 12 here in Miami. And the actions, were, according to police or Miami police, were sexually explicit and racially offensive. Now, here's what we've learned so far about the situation. In the incident report, it says the black lieutenant, who's a victim of the vandalization, called police. The overall damage of the pictures cost $300. The city of Miami says sexually explicit images were drawn on the photos of the lieutenant's family. Also, and even more disturbing, there was a noose made of rope around a picture. Police were called and there was also an internal investigation. Eleven people were relieved of duty with pay, but six of those were fired. Here's the names of those who were fired. 
Captain William Bryson, Lieutenant Alejandro Sessi, Kevin Macizo, Justin Rombaugh, David Rivera, and Harold Santana. Now, the city of Miami did come out with a statement saying that this is unacceptable and they promote diversity within their departments. The detectives here in North Tonawanda say their investigation has led them to 39-year-old Matthew Gerardo. They say Gerardo admitted to starting a fire at the home of volunteer firefighter Ken Walker, who lived directly across the street. Although detectives would not say what led them to Gerardo, they say he admitted to starting the fire at Ken Walker's home yesterday, a fire which came just two days after Walker received a racist and threatening letter in his mailbox. Detectives say Gerardo told them the fire was not racially motivated, but out of anger after he was relieved of his volunteer firefighter duties in July with the Gratwick Fire Company. Investigators say their investigation will now move on to tracking down the person or persons responsible for the threatening letter, which Gerardo says he did not write. Context of white supremacy. Gusty Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Wednesday, November 22nd, 2017. So... I have been told. I just told someone it was the 21st. Darn. We will be here tomorrow for workplace racism, even though a lot of the information that we're going to talk about today is going to be about workplace racism, uh, which is why I emphasize that's something we should be discussing, talking about on a regular basis. It is a massive problem for black people worldwide. I think you can learn a lot about what white supremacy racism is. And how it works, uh, just reflecting on things that happen to us on the job. Uh, that's tomorrow, Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Also wanted to make sure I got in before we got started. Uh, condolences, uh, remembrance for Earl Hyman. Uh, he played the grandfather on The Cosby Show. Uh, if people remember, he had quite a few scenes over over the years. He also had an extraordinary body of work. Uh, in terms of theater and acting, he also narrated the autobiography of Malcolm X, uh, the unabridged version that we read on this program. He narrated that uh, extensive uh, career and he passed away this week at the age of 91, which is extraordinary in and of itself. But uh, Mr. Earl Hyman broadcast for today uh one of our longtime listeners like way way back uh since forever uh retired firefighter in florida has recommended uh, a number of guests i think he recommended that we get uh former fire chief uh, charles phillips on the program he was with us back in 2014 uh he's participated uh lots over the years and and shared many different anecdotes of his time on the fire department he recommended our guest uh, for the program this evening. I uh, was telling folks this past weekend. In fact, I think we had retired firefighter explain the incident of the Opalaka 3, which we will discuss in detail. Uh, I think it's it's great for a myriad of reasons. Uh, when I was preparing for this program, I was trying to think of what audio or, or how I would begin the program. I normally try to have a segment that's relevant to the topic that we're going to discuss. And our guest for the program, he's had different incidents, the Opalaka 3 and what have you, that, you know, generated a lot of media coverage. So I was thinking about that. And I stopped and I said, man, there have been so many different incidents of racism and the fire department, whether it's a black person trying to become a firefighter, a black firefighters being mistreated, not promoted. Just so many different incidents that I remember that we've talked about and reported on over the years. I didn't even do any searching online. I went to my hard drive to just see, I put in firefighter just to see what audio files would pop up. What do I have on my computer? I had about 15 files of exactly what you heard at the beginning of the program. That little four minute segment of black family goes to fire department and turned away for getting ice. Volunteer firefighters house burned down by former white firefighter who's upset that he's on the department. And that white man, uh, Mr. Gerardo, he was convicted. He got 10 years for burning down uh, that black volunteer firefighters residence. This happened last year, too. He got 10 years. And when they sentenced him, the judge said that he didn't think it was racism. This guy was just jealous, not racism. But it was t I didn't even play all of the clips that I had just on my computer. Uh, there was a different report within the last two years. Black firefighter. 
He went with his fellow brethren to put out the fire. It was an elderly white man in his 60s, came out, cursed him, called him a nigger and assaulted him. They ended up having to arrest uh, the white man. It is incredible. Uh, the study of racism and fire departments in the United States. Incredible study. Uh, you can do it longitudinal to see all the, the fights and brawls just to get black people on the fire department. Lots that you can learn. And I think our guest for this evening can provide a lot of insight about the system of racism, white supremacy, and specifically around workplace racism. Uh, he is a retired firefighter from the Miami-Dade County Fire Department. Years of service uh, in the South Florida area, <laughs> dealing with workplace racism and battling blazes uh, to keep folks safe. Uh, in addition, uh, he has worked with the I Care program uh, to help students, uh, particularly black students uh, in the South Florida area, get better resources and improve their academic experience in the great sunshine state. A uh, real pleasure to have him on the broadcast to hear some of his views and experiences. Joining us live from South Florida, our guest, Mr. William D.C. Clark. Mr. Mr. Clark, you with us, sir? Yes, we are. Gus, how you doing, man? Right poorly, but real happy to have you on the broadcast. Uh, excited to be able to get some of your experiences across to our listeners. Uh, for folks, this might be their first time hearing from you. Uh, anything that you think folks should know about who you are, the work you do, uh, that you'd like to share briefly before we get started? Well, I'm a longtime resident of uh, Miami-Dade County, 61 years to be exact. I uh, graduated from the University of Northern Iowa on a football scholarship uh, that was a culture shock, to say the least. I became the second African-American captain in that school's history. I uh, came back and worked a myriad of jobs, uh, uh, teaching the Dade County school system, drug rehab counselor, aircraft servicer, uh, before I settled on. Uh, well, PE teacher, physical education teacher, and uh, I embarked on a 28-year career with Miami-Dade County uh, Fire Department, Fire and Rescue Department, and uh, I've been doing, been active in the community of Miami, particularly around politics and education, uh, for the past 20 years. I also owned uh, Afro Books and Things, uh, which was a black bookstore. Uh, in the Miami area for approximately 13 years and just uh, basically a grunt fighting white supremacy wherever I go. Outstanding. Uh, you already shared, just confirming for folks who have not seen you, you are a black male. Is that correct? That's correct. I know. Uh, this broadcast context of white supremacy, I have unfortunately concluded <clears throat> We are in a global system of white supremacy racism. Uh, I use those two terms, racism, white supremacy, as synonyms and same definition for both terms. The definition I use is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Do you think such a system exists? Do you think that definition is accurate? I know that it exists. <laughs> I'm a victim of white supremacy. And so uh, some of your, your listeners, whether we want to admit that or not, I know as African-Americans, one of the traits that we have almost to a fault is that we're very proud. We don't want to talk about slavery. We don't want to talk about Jim Crow. We don't want to talk about lynching. We don't want to talk about any of those things. But I would like to talk about it under two contexts. First of all, slavery never ended. It's just been modified. And two, uh, I truly believe that we should give ourselves a little bit more credit for overcoming such adversity, so many obstacles, obstacles that we don't even know. Uh, the food industry, how they're trying to poison us. Uh, chemtrails in the uh, air, how they're trying to poison us. They've been giving us ad talking about drinking milk for many years when milk, milk is primarily for cows and bovines and not for humans. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry, how they just continue to give you drug after drug after drug, not with the advent of trying to cure you, 
but to get you hooked. They're the biggest dope pushers in the world, uh, the American Pharmaceutical Company. So we should be applauding each other. For those of us who have been able to maintain some semblance of uh, a regular lifestyle, because we've been under attack since day one. The prison system is against us. Uh, the 13th Amendment says, you know, you are free from slavery unless you are tried and convicted uh, of a crime. And who is arrested more so than anybody else on the face of the earth? Those of us who look like you and I. So we are under the attack, whether we know it or not, whether we admit it or not, we try to find our comfort zone to deal with it, just like Linus with his own personal blanket. But the more you understand it, the more you understand the attacks, the more you're able to deal with it. And as far as the fire department is concerned, the fire department is nothing more than a microcosm of, you know, regular society. Uh, during this Trump era, we now can see crystal clear that what was hidden in the dark is now coming in the light. That, you know, we know that there's a certain segment of society who's hell bent on our destruction. Uh, and one of the main people who sits in that White House. And so hopefully there's a sense of clarity that has come to us. Now we must brainstorm and with each other to find out how we're going to overcome the, these atrocities that are happening every day of our lives. Context of white supremacy. Uh, growing up in the South Florida area, did you see black firefighters? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, actually, you know, like young men do, we had a little gang that then that wasn't hell bent on any destruction, but we used to go shoot birds and robins and rabbits and we had our little bb guns and with our kill if you will we used to skin those animals and pluck those animals and go into the local dump that we that was our personal woods and cook those animals and uh one day we inadvertently set the, the dump on fire <laughs> we tried by going in another route and when we came around uh, we saw a group of firefighters and uh, there was one one young man who happened to be on that truck and he happened to be of uh, my complexion and it was the first time in my life maybe about 10 years old that I laid eyes on a black firefighter I didn't know it was possible I didn't know there were even any black firefighters on the department. But, uh, you know, it was one of those moments that you would never forget. Wow. When, when What year did you actually begin the process of joining the fire department in uh, Miami-Dade County? I uh, joined the fire department in 1983. Okay. I was uh, approximately 26 years old. I knew of a couple of friends who had gone uh, to enter the fire department, uh, but I didn't think anything of it. I had my degree from college. I had some outs that others didn't have. And one day I was, uh, I took the test, you know, out of a whim of a, of a friend who told me to come along. Didn't really do that well on this test. I think I scored 79. So my thoughts of becoming a firefighter were soon dashed because I thought the score was too low. Uh, but a funny thing happened. You're talking about racism and white supremacy. Uh, there was a move by Dade County Police Department to try to hire people outside of Dade County. Uh, the police chief at the time was a guy by the name of Ken Harms. What he did was uh, to convince his higher-ups that they needed to go outside of Miami-Dade County to get applicants. He chose the worst applicants on the list. And guess what he got? He got the infamous river cops because of it. 
I don't know if you know of the, ever heard of those guys. No, sir. But those guys, those guys, the rubber cops, look it up, Google it. Those guys were notorious. They used to uh, beat uh, their assailants. They used to beat uh, uh, people they thought of as criminals. They used to steal their uh, drugs and money. Uh, and because of that, Hans took this information and said, see, I told you that we need to get better clients. But what people didn't realize that he overlooked people who scored very high on the test. He overlooked uh, guys with master's degrees. He didn't intend to bring them on board because he wanted to prove a point. And uh, in the case of the fire department, they followed the same uh, M.O. that Harms uh, created. In essence, what they did was hire what they thought was the worst applicants on the list. And now my 79 came into play. Instead of hiring brothers who score perfect on the test, they hired people they thought that wouldn't make it. And so irregardless of whether or not I was a college graduate, they based they're hiring on me based on that low score. Uh, and I became a part of the fire department. But their intentions were not to keep us. They, had, they were under federal mandate to hire more blacks on the fire department. And normally two or three blacks are hired each class of 36. Uh, this particular class, they had to hire 13 African-Americans out of a class of 36. I was one of those 13. And as we progressed through the class, uh, they begin to eliminate people. First of all, they tried to eliminate you based on your score, the EMT class, emergency, emergency medical technician class uh, or test, in which the state says 70, but the county upped it to 80% passing. And eight out of those 13 guys were caught between 70 and 80. So they gave them pink slips, and luckily those guys challenged it. With me, uh, when it came time to uh, give me my score, the uh, white gentleman who was serving as uh, the captain of that particular training uh, module said to me, uh, Mr. Clark, you got away. However, you have another problem. He said, it appears you have a prior on your record. Once I was arrested for laudering and prowling because I went to see a young lady and I forgot her address. <laughs> so I got caught up in the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time, wrong place, looking for this young lady around 1 o'clock uh, in the a.m. And uh, two gentlemen came out, put guns to my head, said, halt, N-word. You know what to do. I saw you trying to break in my neighbor's house. I was a classroom teacher. I had on a starch shirt, uh, starch jeans, uh, jeans that was so much starch in them you could stand them up by their own. I had on some uh, Valari shoes, and under no circumstances was I was trying to break in somebody's house at 1 o'clock in the a.m., Needless to say, uh, I was arrested, thought that that record was expunged, and it was not. And the gentleman uh, who was serving as the captain of that class basically told me, you have 24 hours to get this done. So right there told, tells you they had no idea of trying to keep us, uh, you know, but a handful of the 13 that they hired just to prove a point. So I was fortunate in that sense to become a firefighter paramedic of 28 years because they were, if they were judging fairly, uh, I would never have been a candidate. Now, this brings us to this point. Again, the fire department is a microcosm of the greater society. Those jobs, those white guys who run those jobs in that department, uh, intended to have those type of jobs for their sons, their nephews, their cousins, 
their brothers, and so forth. The pension is just too good to give to a, a, a black gentleman uh, residing in the hood. And I'm going to give you an example of that. Miami have 300 black firefighters out of 3,000. That's a 10% ratio. Uh, that's one of the highest ratios, with the exception of Chicago and places like that, in the country. New York have over close to 30,000 fire department personnel. You know how many blacks they got? 300. Wow. And so it tells you the racial disparity of what's going on around the country. People don't know about it because we don't expect things like that to happen, but it's happening every day. I think there was just a massive lawsuit filed in uh, New York. That's why I said there massive study <clears throat> one could do just on how fire departments operate in this part of the world. And you will see you can learn an extraordinary amount of detail. And in fact, I just want to make sure I emphasize one of the points that <clears throat> Mr. Clark just made uh, that the white people in charge of Miami-Dade County Fire Department <laughs> the fire department this is not hiring you know lunchroom cafeteria employees this is not hiring somebody who's just gonna their job is going to be to sort out mail for the fire department you have people who say hey i would rather sabotage who we hire for the fire department or for the police department no no we don't want the best candidates I just want to hire people that are going to mess up so that I can prove a point that we don't want these type of people exactly. or we don't want to have niggers in the fire department. So, yeah, we do see that we have qualified black people who could probably do a pretty good job at this. But no, we want to get the wash ups, the people that we know are going to mess this up just so we can prove a point. That is extraordinary. And again, when we talk about Wisdom of Psychopaths is coming up on Friday. That's one. But two, when we talk about values, I think many, many people, many, many, many black, many, many non-white people are very confused with regards to values. If you think white people, racist man, racist woman and racist child, if you think they value anything more than the system of white supremacy, you are mistaken. Not money, not power and apparently not even public safety if we're not willing to hire the most qualified people for these positions. Uh, and you can just listen to the beginning audio if you think public safety is valued more than racism, white supremacy. When we had uh, former fire chief Charles Phillips on the program, and even in his book, Fighting More Than Fires, where he talks a lot about his experience of white supremacy, he said when he started the process of joining the fire department, he had to endure all sorts of terrorism and bullying. He said that the white people told him and the other black people that were in his class, they said, if you need to shower uh, eight times a day, you need to do so. You know, black people stink and we don't want to be around any stinky black people. So if you got to take 10 showers, <laughs> that's what you got to do. Uh, and he said he was asked directly, uh, are you able to work around white people? Uh, they asked him that. He said uh, that they would do things to try to get them angry. If they had like a book in their hand, they would knock it out just to make it a really tumultuous experience. Uh, does that sound familiar to you at all? Uh, very familiar. As a matter of fact, I uh, commend Charles Phillips, who was the first African-American fire chief uh, in Miami-Dade County. He saved me when you talked about that open lock of three situation. We'll I'll talk about it a little later. But uh, he said he and others set the example. And let me go back. I I was I didn't mean to uh, say that all of the black firefighters they hired uh, are not worthy because most are. But in that particular class where they had to hire 13 individuals, there was a, a move to try to get rid of at least 10 of those individuals. So. Uh, the information that I gave was privy to that class. Most of the firefighters are sharp physically and mentally. Uh, they're well equipped to deal with, you know, these obstacles that they face daily. And uh, I commend them. Uh, however, uh, here's another example. And it's not only on the fire department. It's the people that you go uh, and try to help save. On one occasion, I was the only paramedic on the on the uh, 
uh, truck. I just got my paramedic license. Haven't moved to a rescue truck as of yet. So I was riding a fire uh, fire truck at the time uh, as a firefighter. Uh, however, being a paramedic, they prepared a special bu uh, box for me since I was able to administer drugs, uh, intubate a patient, you know, uh, do ALS, advanced life support uh, procedures. So they created a, a special box for me just in case we, we needed it on an emergency. And on one such uh, occasion, uh, we responded to a call in Miami Shores, which is at the time was predominantly a white suburb of the city of Miami. Uh, well, the young lady was hollering frantically, uh, elderly lady, elderly white lady, and she said, uh, my husband is dying. He's having a heart attack. It looks very serious. And as I proceeded to rush into the house uh, to administer, uh, you know, advanced life, support to this gentleman she stopped me i was the only black on the truck three other guys were white and she said i'm sorry uh my, i know my husband is dying but he will not allow you to come into this house and so the officer who happened to be white argued in my behalf that he's the only paramedic uh on this ship he's the only one who's, who was able to give you an idea to administer drugs uh, if you don't let him in, your husband will die. And her response was that he will die because he will definitely die if he saw a black man working on him. So, you know, we can go all night dealing with these types of stories, but that's the reality that we face as black firefighters here in Miami-Dade County. And I'm sure it's the same uh, everywhere across the country. Wow. <laughs> that is extraordinary. Got to make that a sound clip. Extraordinary. And I have heard similar incidents like that, even where a white person might die. Uh, I mean, we're talking about white left, white life, racism, white supremacy. Apparently, white lives do not matter that much. Um, I did want to just put this in context because you said you this is not ancient history. That's something I try to emphasize a lot as well, because a lot of times people try to make it seem as though these type of things happened a long time ago. Every audio clip that I played at the beginning of the program, those things happened within the last three years. Every single one of them, some of them happened this year. I think at least one of the incidents happened within the last 30 days. You said you you joined the fire department. This started in 1983. Is that correct? In 1983, that's correct. Okay. This is in the middle of the Miami Hurricanes football dynasty where they're winning national championships. Exactly. You got Michael Irvin running around on the field and all of their great accomplishments, all these black athletes. That's the story that they tell. The Miami Hurricanes, it brought the city together. We had all those riots uh, down in Overtown and everything was all bad and the team helped bring things together. All of that's happening in the 80s. And you have a black firefighter EMT who can't even come in to save a white person's life. Wow. Who's, who's begging, wow. who's begging the wife to let me save her husband, but to no avail. That's, that's crazy. How but that again, listen, I, that was, that was the, the, the tune for the day. I've had firefighters, uh, put piss on my pillows. Wow. Um, uh, you know, you go through things like that. So you can't leave your food around. You can't leave your drink around. You respond on the call and you come back and you're leery of whether or not you should finish your sandwich or your sub that you left behind. These are the obstacles. These are the things that we faced every day. Some, some were able to handle it. Others were not. Uh, there was some psychological damage done to my fellow black firefighters because they couldn't handle the constant barrage of insults, the psychological game played the physical games that were played. The, the incident that you spoke of in the city of Miami uh, was, uh, was the aftermath of one that was more egregious than that just a couple of years ago. I don't know if you heard about the scrotum on the head case where they tied a firefighter to a, a chair and wrapped him up in duct tape. And they, after he was secured and bound where he could not move, they took out their genitals and slapped their their uh, 
balls in their genitals all over his face and mouth. This is a guy who's a family man, a husband, a father who had to endure that. And guess what? He sued them, I think, for a total of $1.7 million. Uh, and he was awarded that amount. Uh, I guess that type of money would help ease the humiliation. But guess what? They, overtur they later overturned the uh, verdict. Why? Because they said that in previous incidents, he was part and parcel of the same situation. So here's a black man involved in, you know, that kind, kind of shenanigans uh, just to fit in. But people like uh, Michael Imani, myself, Hassan, uh, Mackey, R.C. Uh, Nehemiah, those firefighters like that, we adopted a code. And that saying was never let it hit the ground because too many black firefighters were taking that type of abuse home. And some would take it out on those that were closest to them, meaning their wife and children. So the psychological scars and effect, some didn't even realize what was happening to them. But they were acting and, and reacting to uh, white supremacy and the tenets of white supremacy uh, and those obstacles that they had to face on the fire department every day. And so those of us who were, quote, conscious of the situation and of the matter, we adopted a code that said never let it hit the ground. In other words, if a white boy, white male tried to do anything untoward uh, against you, you would address it right then and immediately. Get it out of your system, address it. It got to the point where now we're being uh, labeled as racist. And most of your listeners know that black people can't not be racist simply because we do not go around saying that we're, first of all, superior than anyone else. And then we don't have the apparatus to, to hold you or your family members back from achieving their goals. Uh, the United States government backs your ideology of white supremacy. Black folks do not have that pleasure. Context of white supremacy. Never let it hit the ground. Logical to me. I need to just make sure I go back. Um, you said firefighting. I can't emphasize that enough. We're not working at Google. <laughs> this is not a tech company. We're not working at McDonald's where I expect the employees to mishandle the food and to <laughs> do all sorts of untowards things. We're working at the fire department. <laughs> These are supposed to be the most upstanding <laughs> citizens, public servants. And you get oh, and you've got this sort of misconduct going on to answer your question. Yes, I was familiar with scrotumizing uh, that whole terroristic and homoerotic practice that was referenced in the most recent incident with the Miami Dade fi uh, fi Miami Dade County Fire Department, where they fired. I believe it was six uh, firefighters where they had placed a noose That's correct. on a photo of a, a black firefighter and they drew penises on the family photo. And so I'm glad the <laughs> the newspaper in Miami, they gave full context that this is not new, that they've been dealing with this sort of misconduct for decades, apparently, and seem helpless to stop it, which is, you know, <laughs> that says a lot to me. But you said that they threw urine on your pillow. How in the world did you deal with that situation? Well, uh, I first found out when I, you know, after a call, I laid my head down and I began to smell, you know, urine. I, and it wasn't strong. It wasn't a lot. But the the, the scent was, you know, undeniable uh, urine. And so I got up, I smelled around, and it was definitely on my pillow. And so... Uh, didn't think anything of it. Uh, well, that's not so. I, I took the pillow off the bed, uh, slept at the other end of the bed, took the linen off the bed, slept at the, the other end of the bed. And the very next shift, I saw two of my fellow white firefighters talking and laughing and giggling about the incident and what they did. And these two guys were known to be ca uh, characters. 
and probably belongs to some white supremacist group. And uh, so I put one and one together and got two. But they made one big mistake. And I guess uh, the statute of limitations uh, have run its course, so maybe I can say this. <laughs> but they love my food. They love that island cooking. I, my, my people have uh, Bahamian roots. So I can cook, you know, mean dish of peas and rice and fish and uh, okra and tomato and things of that nature. And they made the mistake of letting me cook for them. And so all I could tell you was my payback was they have a lot more in common with the dog next door than they would ever know. And I'll leave it at that. Context of white supremacy. <laughs> Mr. William D.C. Clark. Uh, if, if anything, I will definitely encourage folks to keep all of this in mind the next time that people are talking about doing some sort of potluck at work and eating food with your <laughs> colleagues. Nix all of that and just remember <laughs> Mr. D.C. Clark the next time they talk about having some sort of potluck uh, on your job and they go, oh, I brought donuts in. <laughs> I'm good. I'm dieting, lactose intolerant, whatever you got to make. <laughs> I already ate my wife. We're going out to eat tonight. I can't eat. My mother-in-law is cooking. Whatever you need to make up, have your excuse ready. Um, what, what would you say? to black people who might say, man, Mr. Clark, being a firefighter, that is a noble profession. And even for a black person, hey, if you want to be a black person, so you can do this and inspire other black people and all that, great. But I mean, hey, any job where they, you know, are, are you got to worry, they're, are they putting stuff in my food? They're throwing urine on my pillow, might even be trying to put their genitals on my face and all these, these other forms of terrorism and harassment. Why not just get another job? Why endure this for 28 years? Well, it's something because uh, all of our jobs is to make it better for the next generation. And I think that's what we did. We fought that fight. Uh, it was a necessary fight to fight. Why? Because if we would have gave it up and bailed, then the next guy, the next black firefighter, was going to endure the same type of overt and covert racism. Uh, that we uh, encountered. So I believe that our walk on the fire department uh, and the way we handle things as black men, not afraid to confront uh, the racist ways of our fellow firefighters. And, and let me be clear, all of them, we're not going to paint every white firefighter with a broad brush because some I considered friends. Some I considered uh, friendly enough, if you will, uh, to have conversations with, to go out and eat with, to trust to a certain degree. However, if they had to choose whether they were going to be on our side or the side of white, the white supremacists, that's a no-brainer. We knew where their allegiances lie. And so we're not, we were not fooled. We were very cordial toward our fellow men. We had uh, great conversations with them for those who, of them who were not afraid of us because the group that I belong to and which uh, your frequent caller Michael Imani belonged to, I Am Miami, we were those guys. I won't say we were Black Panthers, but we were that group of individuals actually few from the fire department. We actually came together uh, at the fire department to fight uh, white supremacy on the fire department. And it expanded to fighting white supremacy globally or wherever we uh, laid our feet. So we used to pass out literature. We used to hold Marcus Garvey uh, events in the park, Malcolm X events at the park, Kwanzaa balls, and all of those type of events that will educate our community into what they were facing, not only in the workplace, but in the, in the regular world. We were that group. And because we were that group, people started calling us racist. No, what they got from us is our reaction to racism and white supremacy. Again, we cannot be racist. They got our reaction 
to racism and white supremacy. White folks on that fire department was used to just running over the average brother, not us. We were that crew. And so uh, to segue into uh, that uh, Open Locker 3 incident, it was soon after 9-11, uh, I made a trip to uh, my old stopping ground, which was Station 26. Uh, basically, we had forged friendships with all of the individuals. They're white and black alike. And I was now at another station. So when I had an opportunity to go back and work some overtime at the station, I knew there were a few guys still left there. And so I took that overtime. And, and sure enough, there were some fellow black firefighters, uh, Jim uh, Moore and Terry Williams, and a few white guys that I worked with, uh, Paul Simon and Phil DeMaria. Uh, everybody was talking about the collapse of the t Twin Towers. But, of course, the black firefighters were uh, talking about how could those towers uh, collapse like that. We have never seen in years of fighting fire, fire, fighting fire that buildings would collapse like that unless it was an implosion like you do when you bring down a building. And besides, we know a little bit about fire properties. We know that the story they were given about jet fuel uh, from those planes uh, melting that steel, that's not so. Because jet fuel burns at 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. That steel was the strongest steel in the world, and it will not be uh, compromised unless it's a long burn at about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So jet fuel could not uh, compromise that steel in, in the Twin Towers. So we knew something was fishy right away. Um, Imani and I were on the phone immediately afterwards saying, listen, it, it can't happen that way. It had to be an inside job. Uh, there had to be some tie beams, explosive tie beams at different sections of, of that steel to bring it down like a pancake. And, you know, to make matters uh, worse, you had another 47-story building uh, that collapsed with nothing hitting it. So what was this story behind that? So we were talking about it, and uh, I knew Jim, one of the other firefighters, had taken the flag off the truck, but it was for safety reasons. The, the flag was tilting over. It was uh, the collapse that was holding this large, this very huge flag was uh, tattered and about to come apart, so he took the flag off the truck. I didn't think anything uh, more uh other than that i did see some some uh big wheels come come by later in the day but i thought they were just stopping by i had no clue that they were talking about the removal of the flag what i later found out was since i was in overtime it was uh generally considered one of the worst rabble rousers from a black perspective on the fire department they were about to hold a meeting about the incident, but they waited until I left uh, before the meeting was held. So the first call I got about it, this was on a Saturday uh, afternoon. I left at about 7 p.m. They had a subsequent meeting after 7 p.m. to talk to the two other guys about the removal of the flag. Yeah, didn't have that knowledge at all. The first knowledge I got about it was my friend, Michael Imani, who called me on Monday and said, man, what happened over at Station 26? And I said, what was supposed to happen? They said, man, they, you guys, three Muslims, which we are not Muslims, uh, and they didn't say black Muslims, they are talking about Arab Muslims, uh, were reportedly uh, reported to t have taken the flag off the fire truck and refused to ride on any calls with the flag attached to the truck. I said, man, that did not happen at all. Imani said, man, that's the story. It's all on the news. And I was on my way to a Lisa Keys <laughs> Maxwell concert. So I brushed my partner off until I went to work on Saturday. I mean, I'm sorry, that Wednesday. 
and what which was no what was normally a one truck a station had about six trucks in front of it. So right away I knew something was up. I walked in and it was like E. F. Hutton. Everybody was quiet. And uh one of the residents resident rednecks uh said, Well why are y'all not talking now? Here the man is Ask him the questions. And I said, Steve, what's happening? He said, you don't know? He said, what happened to Red 26? I said, man, you're the second person who asked me about Station 26. What was supposed to happen? He grabbed my arm. He said, well, let me, let me show you something. He, he walked me across the bay and uh, turned on the radio. And on the radio was a local station, WIND. And our uh, president, our local uh, 1403 president, Stan Hills, who was a graduate uh, and considered a friend of mine. So the radio personality asked Stan if these guys are found guilty of removing the flag, um, what would you do to them? And Stan immediately said, we'll move to have them fired. And the radio personality said, fire my ass. Let's tie them up to a rocket and ship them to Afghanistan. Well, immediately I, I was faced with a situation I had no clue about. I hadn't talked to the other two gentlemen to get their side of the story. So basically, the media tracked me down and uh, started shoving mics in my face. And one guy said, you know, it's funny. We were talking about the flag now with Donald Trump. Well, the same thing happened there. He shoved the mic in my face and said, what do you think about the American flag? I said, well, the tenets of the American flag, freedom, justice, and equality are all laudable. But you have to admit that those tenets don't apply to us all in this country. So that set a wave of anger amongst my fellow European firefighters, uh, the press kept coming and I kept giving it to them. I said, listen, I feel for my fellow firefighters uh, in New York, my fellow police officers, we're all a part of the same family, if you will, same union, and I feel for their families. But no one talks about how thousands of black people die in this country every day due to racism and white supremacy and the tenets thereof. And, of course, that was not met with, you know, the greatest of uh, joy. And so I began to get death threats. I did radio programs like this all over the country, Detroit, New York, Los Angeles. They wanted to know the skinny on what truly happened. New York firefighters were coming to, uh, they threatened to kill me. Uh, I had to relocate my family uh, for their safety. Every day for about two, three months, I was met with a throng of reporters uh, looking for an exclusive. Uh, and it got to the point where even the ACLU uh, came to our defense. But that did not hold off too long because when they had a meeting with the lawyers who were also Jews, Jewish individuals at the county, Day County uh, government office, the lawyers at the county tried to convince our lawyers uh, that you, you're, you're actually uh, supporting guys who you shouldn't support. And uh, they reminded them that we were the same guys who uh, went to a rally in Bayfront Park and held up signs that said, uh, Jews, the chosen people, my ass. And, you know, it's something that I regret. It wasn't the greatest of, of things that we should have done. But we did hold up that sign uh, during the first Gulf War uh, with the first President Bush. And at that particular rally, there were 6,000 people. 2,000 saw the sign and began to chase after us. 
so much so that the police had to surround us for our safety. Um, but the situation on the fire department was resolved when they went to Charlie Phillips, that same Charlie Phillips that you had as a guest, and said, Charlie, we want you to fire those guys. And Charlie said, I did an investigation. I did my own investigation and found out that what Clark is saying is true, that it was a safety issue and not an issue of trying to respond Oh, they would not respond due to the flag being attached to the truck. As a matter of fact, we ran calls all day, so that was a lie. Uh, as a, and, and again, I thought it was one of our best days together because everybody knew each other. Everybody respected each other. Uh, the, the captain, Phil DiMaria, was a New Yorker, and I turned to him, and I said, Phil, listen, my condolences to you. Uh, did you know any of those guys? And he said, yeah, Clark, I used to ride with him when I went home to New York. I said, man, I'm sorry. And forgive us if we're saying things about this. And he said, man, I'm, I'm used to you guys. You're not saying anything negative because I feel the same way. Those buildings shouldn't have come down uh, due to that type of fire. Something smell fishy. That's his words. So uh, for a couple of years, uh, I was relocated to special events to serve out my time on the fire department because everybody would refuse to work with me. Um, I would not take promotional exams because I didn't want to be around people who would not protect me. Um, you know, it was a harrowing experience. You couldn't depend on them. And one thing about firefighters, no matter where you come from, your background, you had each other back when you went into a fire or an adverse situation. You knew that if you went down, like I went down on one particular fire, I uh, actually went through the floor of someone's living room and had to depend on a couple of firefighters to pick me up before the fire engulfed me. Uh, so you, you have to have that, that type of trust in each other. And needless to say, that trust eroded. Uh, with me in that particular situation. I'm sure it did for the other two guys involved. So, uh, I just want to ask me a question. <laughs> As a part of this experience, the, the Miami New Times, uh, they have a, a article about the Opalaka 3, and they write that you, the department, that they talked about the statements that you made about what, what do you, when you were asked, what do you think of the flag? And they said uh, that those remarks incited a furor of anti-fire department sentiment and, and the barrage of offensive remarks, which you said in response. Uh, and he said that they had a memo and they wanted you to sign and you refused to sign it. Is that correct? That's correct. Did they ever try to force you to, to sign this, I guess, write up some sort of uh, write up for you, for your, I guess. Yeah, because they wanted to, they wanted to put it in my file those type of uh, disciplinary action stays in your file for two years. Uh, and we have to understand the total context. Here is uh, the media and my fellow firefighters coming at me for something I did not do, had no inkling of doing. Uh, the threats, they, had, they actually created a page in which to vent their frustrations and the, the venom that was on that page, I mean, you're reading this as a human being, uh, you become pissed off. So, yes, I reacted once again, not came out in front of, I reacted to the venom that I was subjected to. And so, in essence, uh, they got the worst of me. Uh, however, it was because of their actions. They didn't come and ask me anything. What is your side of the story? They didn't ask me anything. I was guilty until proven innocent. They, they involved my family, my lifeblood. Man, one thing I can tell that anybody that knows me knows that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die anyway, but I'm going to die as a man, on my feet instead of on my knees, looking them straight in the eye instead of looking down at the pavement. So in essence, what you got from me is me being that warrior that was protecting my family, protecting my space, protecting my life. 
And I was willing to die at that moment to do all of those things. And so to accuse me, listen, I went to Northern Iowa. I, I was calling Uncle Tom in high school for how I treated or got along with white students. Uh, even though they call me the most one of the most racist individuals in the world, I know how to get along with folks. I, uh, I was in, involved in a Youth for Christ movement before, be, be, until I understood that no white, blue-eyed individual is coming to save me or anybody else. And so <laughs> I got along with most until you pissed me off. And so in essence, that's what it was. Uh, you know, I had to defend myself. I had to defend my territory. And those remarks, once again, was a reaction to those taunts and to those uh, racist uh, bars that was thrown in my direction. Mm. What happened, you, you said, and again, just emphasizing with the job as a firefighter, literally, you could die if you have some sort of feud or workplace spat. It's not just a situation of, you know, this person uh, takes my chair and gives me the squeaky chair in the office uh, when I leave. That's our spat, you know, or they don't they don't sign my birthday card or what have you. This is you could die if you're working with someone. Well, that, well let me let, let me well, let me give you a perspective. Mm. We deal with needles, right? Mm. We come of come we come across people with AIDS and HIV, right? Mm. Who's to say that one of those individuals don't inject an uh, AIDS infected patient and withdraw their blood and save it to inject in my apple wow. or my fruit or my wow. banana or my drink? This is what we're dealing with. This is what I dealt with. This is totally life or death particularly with the stance we took. They were not used to black firefighters standing up and being men. They were not used to black firefighters addressing white supremacy on a daily basis. They were not used to individuals speaking up for their manhood. They were not used to individuals like myself and Imani and R.C. Nehemiah and uh, Hassan Mackey and others. Just being men, they were not used to that. They wanted to control little boys. And any time we stood our ground, that was a problem to them. It wasn't a problem to us because we were going to be men 24-7, 365. That's what we vowed once we found out what we were, were dealing with. So they weren't used to it. What the hell was that? We were not going to cow down to their racist ways. Again, it's our reaction. I don't mean nobody on the face of this planet any harm. And that's including white people. But I'd be damned if they wish me some harm and I don't do anything about it. And I'm sorry for getting a little heated under these circumstances, but those memories uh, I live with every day. Mm context of white supremacy again our guest mr william dc clark uh dedicated nearly three decades to the miami dade county fire department uh after all of this tumult and this how long exactly you were on paid leave for exactly how long i think it was about two months uh there was one such incident that i failed to mention uh, which could have gotten me a lot of money, but we screwed that up. Uh, as you know, as some of you know, they have the NASCAR championship in Miami-Dade every year at, in Homestead. Uh, it just concluded last week, as a matter of fact, for this year. And as a person working in special events, I was scheduled to work down there until the CEO of the racetrack got a win of the fact that I was supposed to be scheduled there and he came out and said he don't want me down there and then other firefighters who were also scheduled white firefighters who were scheduled to uh, work down there also said if Clark comes we're walking out which if they walked out you couldn't have the race now this is big time um 
but a few black chiefs came to me and acted as a buffer to the powers that be and basically stated, Clark, listen, you got to do us a favor. You cannot go down there or that entire race will be canceled or postponed or held back. And that's a nationally televised uh, situation down there. And we can't have the fire department being at fault for it not running smoothly. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to give you four vouchers that you could deliver probably in 30 minutes. And we're going to pay you, you know, X amount of dollars. I, I, I think they paid me $2,500 for, for the weekend. Uh, Art was just like uh, Charlie Phillips. Those guys were the older guys. They were those individuals uh, who started the Progressive Firefighter Association, PFA. So in a sense, I was indebted to them. And that's the angle that I took. It wasn't about me and the, mo and the money. I just saw some of my older brothers who life would have got a little bit difficult if they didn't deliver. However... All I had to do was go down there, if for but an hour, a half an hour, and disrupt that situation for a half an hour, I would have proved my case because the case tinged on, uh, you know, a working environment that wasn't conducive to, to my health and well-being, trying to prove that point. And, of course, if I would have went down there and those guys would have been true to their word and walked off, even for a few minutes, I would have proved uh, that the working conditions were not conducive to me, uh, you know, being safe, to be, to be honest with you. So I blew that. That, too, probably was a million-dollar uh, situation involved. But I did it because uh, my brothers asked me to. Now, if I had to do it all over again, I may have taken a different route. But... Those are the type of things that we've gone through on this department. Hmm. If you had it to do over again, uh, rewinding all the way back to, I guess, the, the one of the earlier incidents uh, in this situation, when the camera folks came and said, you know, Mr. Clark, uh, what do you think of the flag? Would you say the same thing that you said then or would you give a different response? Honestly, um, the response probably wouldn't have been exactly the same, but the way it all went down and the pressures that came to bear, you had firefighters calling me every minute on the, on the minute, cursing, threatening. These are guys that I know. You had guys who were praising me on a fire just a, uh, two weeks ago saying how great of a firefighter I was were now calling me out of my name, monkeys, animals, go back to Africa, this, that, and the other. So with all of that pressure, and probably more than anything else, make sure your family is safe because we can find them anywhere in this world was a, a taunt that I got that probably put me over the top uh, because then now I'm, I'm buying up weapons, um, Imani was a gun enthusiast. I think I borrowed five of his weapons uh, just to protect myself. So, you know, in hindsight, I probably would have tried to handle it a little better. But because, I, you know, my words actually put my family in more danger than need be. But uh, we still had to address it and maybe in a calmer or cooler manner that we could have addressed that, that situation. Context of white supremacy. Again, Mr. William D.C. Clark. If you have questions you would like to ask, the number to dial 641-715-3640. The code 564-943-POUND. Press star six one if you would like to participate. 
Uh, that number again, 641-715-3640. The code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if you would like to participate. With the <laughs> scrotomizing incident, I know one of our listeners was stunned. I guess that was uh, the first time uh, for some folks hearing uh, about that, which I can understand. Um, did you have a code? And, and this is one, I think, uh, retired firefighter uh, he shared on the program over the years. And I think he you know, talked about that incident. Uh, I didn't know that this was a widespread decades long thing that apparently is still, you know, continuing in some form. Um, we talked about just not getting involved. I think you said the black male in that case, he had, you know, his million dollar suit and then they overturned it because he'd been participating. We talk all the time about, hey, on on these jobs, do not participate in any of these jokes. It's not the time to be horsing right. around. You want to be really serious. Are there other like specific details that you can give out to just kind of make sure that you're not having the hazing situation or just any other racist attacks on the job to try to minimize just specific details about not letting it hit the ground that you would uh, suggest black people carry out in the workplace. Well, again, what often happens and not only on the fire department on all uh, type of work uh, place environment. Uh, they are, we as a people are subjected to white jokes. We're subjected to racist bobs. Our women are subjected to sexual innuendos. Our men are subjected to uh, things that are beneath them. But in an effort to keep our jobs, in an effort to get along, in an effort to not make them feel uncomfortable, we compromise ourselves. And so I think what you see with women coming out and talking about sexual harassment, that needs to be a worldwide or community-wide or statewide thing. In other words, any untoward acts toward you is an untoward act toward us all. So we got to think in terms of a collective. What are you doing to stop the advancement of white supremacy in your, at your workplace, in your community, on your job, or in life in general? I remember a situation as a firefighter, but it was off duty. I stopped by when I got off from work and a young Hispanic male, uh, a, a young lady working at the gas station as an attendant was talking to me about something, maybe a current event. And this young male with my presence, with me being there to see this, literally grabbed this female by the buttocks with both hands in front of me. I'm in a firefighter uniform, man, but that did not matter to this young cat. And he grabbed it and he squeezed it. It was no different than a slave master grabbing a slave at will. I can do with you what I want to do with you because you work for me. And the pain on that sister's face hurt me so bad. I'm in uniform and probably could have been reported and probably fired for what I'm about to say. But I told that young guy, what you did was not only violated her, you violated me as well. You did not give a damn what either one of us thought. Therefore, I'm going to give you something in return. I'm going to come back every day for the next month. And if you so more than put your hands on that black woman. I will come back and kill you myself. And I said, if you think I'm lying, try me. And for every day I came, not only did I come, I brought about three or four of my guys with me and we checked on her and asked her in front of him, did he touch you? Well, apparently he got the message, never touched her again. I've seen that woman years and years later. 
she worked at that gas station maybe about 20, 30 years. And I would see her periodically throughout time. Uh, and she told me that that was the greatest gesture she's ever seen of a black man. She told her husband, that's that guy I talk to you about all the time. And I, and not patting myself on the back, but I think we got to get to that level. We cannot let any transgression toward us, our people, ourselves, as an individual, our family, go without it touching the ground. Because only then will they get the message. An uh, isolated incident like me or a few brothers throughout the country doing what they're supposed to do is not good enough. We have to be diligent. We have to be soldiers. I refer to myself as a grunt on the front line all the time because we are in a fight. We are at war with white supremacy, whether you want to know it or not. All of this why you see interracial commercials being shown with more frequency. They're locking us up, dehumanizing us. Last hired, first fired. And then our women becomes the spoils of war. Not on my watch, bro. I'm just letting you know. Not on my watch. It will never touch the ground when I witness it. Mr. William D.C. Clark. Uh, we will check, see if we have callers who have a question uh, that they would like to ask. Uh, we have a few other details I want to ask about the bookstore aspect as well. Uh, folks who dialed in, let's see, uh, retired firefighter, uh, if you had a question for Mr. Clark, line should be open. Feel free. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I would rather for uh, uh, the other uh, callers to, uh, to ask Mr. Clark questions. Uh, I, I have all kind of opportunity to uh, spend time with Mr. Clark, and uh, I'll, I'll come in later on in the program. Right on. Appreciate the uh, recommendation. Uh, retired firefighter, longtime uh, listener, longtime participant uh, in the broadcast. Uh, I will nab other hands uh, as we proceed. I'll take this time to make sure I do not forget. Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, in the broadcast uh, that you also, in addition to your long years of service with the fire department, that you operated a bookstore, Afro Books and Things, for 13 years uh, in Miami. That seems, I don't know. I don't know how many firefighters have a bookstore. What prompted uh, your interest in having a bookstore? Well, to be honest with you, the fire department did. Uh, I met some extraordinary young men. Mr. Imani was one of them. A brother by the name of Franz Jackson, a.k.a. R.C. Nehemiah. We met some individuals that were avid readers, knew a little bit about what was going on politically. We first tried to politicize the Progressive Firefighters Association, but at that time, they thought that we bought a little bit more heat than necessary. So we developed a group of our own, which was called I Am Miami, and the acronym stands for International African Movement. Again, we were a literary slash political organization. We tried to read before we go out there and speak. We listen as well as speak. And we tried to pass on inf information uh, that we found pertinent to the survival and the elevation of uh, the non-white community here in Miami-Dade County and throughout uh, the rest of, the, of America and the world. So we used to meet at the bookstore. Uh, uh, we met there maybe three times a week. We began to read books. Uh, pedagogy of the of the oppressed, Paulo Freire, Franz Fanon, books by uh, Joseph Ben Yachin, uh John Henry Clark, Asa Hilliard, Leonard Jeffries. Anything on Malcolm X, M Brother Imani is an expert on Malcolm X, and then from that we branched out on cleaning up communities. Launch my gardens, taking disadvantaged kids to to the beach, 
or just having a picnic in the community. We spoke out uh, against uh, police brutality, and this was 30 years ago. Um, we did those things that we thought would help elevate the mental capacity of our community. Uh, they say what you don't know will hurt you, will, won't hurt you. That's the biggest BS we've ever heard. Because if you don't know what's going on in your life and around you, then you have no control. If you don't have any control of the politics or the policemen or the economics in your community, then you have no control. We were fortunate to meet individuals like uh, Nilly Fuller, Dr. Nilly Fuller. Brother Imani and myself had him in my home. And we use, I, I remember, and we say this all the time, I remember one of us using the term Uncle Tom. And nearly full of school that's right there on the spot. He said, Bro, brothers, I don't use those type of terms. He said, you know why? As I look at you in the clothes that you're wearing, clearly no black, black outfit or company made those tennis, those sneakers. Surely no black company made those pants and that shirt that you're wearing. Surely no black company made the underwear that you're wearing. And they definitely didn't create the money that you may have in your pocket. Therefore, you too are depending on someone else for your very existence. So in essence, there's a little Tom in all of us. So refrain. If we're trying to heal each other and elevate each other, refrain from condemning, castigating, and putting each other down. That was a very valuable lesson uh, for me and for us. And we refrain from referring to other black people in a negative sense and in a negative fashion ever since that day. So back to the bookstore, uh, there was an elderly couple who owned it, Dr. Earl and Ursula Wells, very well known. They ran the store for about 15 to 20 years themselves prior. One was an assistant superintendent, and the other one was an administrator, but she was known mostly for being a principal. Well, we heard they were getting ready to close the doors. And four of us, the gentleman I've been naming uh, all along, Imani, R.C. Nehemiah, and, and uh, Mackie, went to them with the advent of purchasing it from them. It was a diamond in the rough. It was where everybody met, all of those uh, conscious individuals who are trying to do something positive in the community. This is where they got their resources from. So we couldn't, didn't want to see it go to waste. So we put up a proposal to purchase it from them, but that proposal fell apart because we had some ideo ideological differences. It was at that time my wife and I went to them and asked them would they sell it to us and they agreed to sell it to us. So we ran it for from 1993 to 2006. We were fortunate enough to have everyone from Maya Angelou, Winnie Mandela, John Henry Clark, Asa Hilliard, and many, many, many individuals come through that store. It was a landmark. And that's how we referred to it. And I think that that store benefited us all in the long run. Did you get uh, Mr. Fuller down to the bookstore? Yes, again, we, he went from the bookstore to my home, my personal home. It was a, it was a visit that I, I never forgot because he taught us so much. And it was candid. It was off the record. He told us some things he probably would never say out in the public. Uh, Mr. Imani and myself were privy to his company, and he taught us a lot during that visit. We were very fortunate to have him amongst our midst. Wow. 
Outstanding. Great lesson about uh, Uncle Tom's. Very important lesson. Something I try to stress on the broadcast as well. Also making sure I do not forget. uh, When you mentioned at the very beginning, I made a note. You said that you were in culture shock. You got a football scholarship, Iowa State uh, University to play football. Go Cyclones. Uh, I think you said it was two (laughs) African-Americans. Uh, on the was it on the well, team? Go ahead. I'm sorry. well, actually, it was North, Northern Northern Iowa University, Northern Iowa, okay. Uh, not 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 uh, Iowa State. It was because I chose that school because I had friends at Iowa State, I wanted to be close to them. Uh, and at the at that time, there were four African Americans on the on the team total. Wow, uh, out of 60, 70 players. Uh, and I would like to thank uh, that I was a trailblazer because now half the team uh, is, is black. And so I went back for a 30-year reunion and literally was shocked to see so many African-American brothers being a part of that team. And to think that I had something to do with that was, you know, was very nice. Did you have any difficulties at Northern Iowa. Thank you for the correction. Did you have uh, any issues with racism, white supremacy as a student or student athlete? Yes, actually I did. I was in my infancy as far as my growth, uh, self-growth about self and my Afrocentricity was concerned. Didn't know too much, only listening to stories. I had a professor who actually, a white gentleman who actually taught African American history. And upon his introduction, the very first thing out of his mouth was that all you have to know out of this class is that the continent of Africa was put on this earth to aid Europeans. And its people was made to serve white people. I kid you not. That's the very first thing out of his mouth. And so when he said that, everybody just, I was the only black in the class, everybody just turned to me. And I didn't say anything at first, and he asked me, Mr. Clark, you have something to say? I said, well, I took this class to learn more about Africa, but your premise is all wrong. I heard that Africans would, Africa was the richest continent on the face of the planet. It was the cradle of civilization. Uh, it had kings and queens, many minerals, diamonds, cobalt, and enough food to feed uh, the world. I say, therefore, I disagree with your premise. Mind you now, there was no Internet. <laughs> there was no, no Google. And most of the books on the subject uh, were not in place in Iowa. So he asked me to prove it. And I set out to prove him wrong. Uh, And I tried everything, calling uncles and aunts and relatives and people that I knew who would have some resources of the subject matter. And they would send it to me and I'll present that information to him, and all he would say is, you got to consider the source. you talking about black people writing this information, and you know that old adage, white folks, there's not a law or a rule or any information that white folks uh, have to respect coming from black people. And that's what I dealt with. Uh, I was so uh, frustrated. Uh, with this gentleman uh, in this particular class. I passed every every lesson, every test he uh, administered, and I thought I was, had an A average. He gave me a C minus in the class, at which time it was approaching summer, and I said a silent prayer that I wish uh, he would die. Two months later, he did. And so I don't mess with that (laughs) anymore. Uh, I don't believe certain things, but 
you got to believe in the power from within. So be careful what you ask for. Uh, but all in all, I work to me was a learning experience. What it taught me most of all was that we give white folks too much credit and ourselves very little. Hmm. We put them on a pedestal unnecessarily, unnecessarily so, and we denigrate ourselves unnecessarily so. If we only understood the power that we have within, if we only understood the power that we collectively have, look what's happening to the NFL right now. For those people who are boycotting the NFL, power. Look what's happening to Papa John's. You've almost put Papa John's out of business because you stopped buying the product. What would happen to America if blacks only shop at took one Christmas and only shop at a black store forsaking all major anchors and white establishment just for one Christmas? You would turn this economy upside down. But we don't see that power from within. And so we continue, as the last poet said, <laughs> to shuck and jive and to be us our way through this thing, forsaking the power that we have as an individual and forsaking the power that we have as a collective entity. And until we get to that point, we're going to continue to be second-class entities in this or any other world context of white supremacy the number again 641-715-3640 the code 564-943-POUND press star 61 if you would like to participate uh, can you also share a little bit about your involvement with the eye care program uh, down in South Florida trying to help out young children? Yes. Uh, you know, uh, across the country, you have black high schools versus black high schools arguing with each other, particularly on a sports context. I'm better than you. I'm better than you. Mm. Very little is done uh, on the academic side because we're so entrenched against each other because of our sports affiliations, right? So we begin to understand that nothing was getting done. We, were, we had the same arguments, the same concerns, and, and the same results. So we decided that each alumni president from the seven inner city schools, uh, and some, one or two of them are not necessarily in the inner city, but they ascribe to a uh, mostly black uh, population as far as the student body is concerned. Uh, Central, Northwestern, uh, Jackson, Edison, Norland, Carroll City, and Booker T. All of the alumni presidents, or most there are, got together and said, listen, let's operate as a collective. Let's stop fighting each other. Let's operate as a collective, form it a, a, a strong entity. And when we approach the school system uh, and our fight to elevate our schools to the same height or level playing field that other more affluent schools are, are on, then we do it as a collective unit. And so we became incorporated. We begin to fight for resources that were no longer there. We begin to fight for administrators that can take our schools to the next level instead of giving us your worst, give us your best administrators. We also wanted some black males in the mix because our children, many of them don't have father figures at home. So we wanted so not no disrespect to the women out there. I uphold black women to the highest uh, uh, of, of heights. But in those inner city schools, there was a dearth of black males, and we needed black males, whether they're the principals or sister principals, we needed them in those positions. 
So now when we went to the administration or the school board, we went with seven as opposed to one. And our cry, our plea, our demands begin to get heard. We bought with them such ideas as licensing and branding because in most inner city schools, you have your best athletes, yet you have national publications, national sports sites selling our kids' likenesses and images across the country. They're even selling our gear without one red cent going back to the district or the affected schools. It's ironic that the most talented schools, athletically speaking, always seem to be the most poorest schools. And yet everybody's getting rich off of them but us. And that was one tenet. Um, uh, most of our, our demands centered around educational uh, purposes. We needed schools that were new and improved and conducive to a learning environment. We needed uh, programming uh, that was conducive to us getting jobs immediately after school, academies. Uh, the NAF academies are a big thing now. We needed magnets that would draw other students to our schools to elevate the grade because we're on that grade system. Uh, that reach for the top that Jeb Bush and George Bush and even o Barack Obama supported. Uh, love our black president. Some say that he's a plant, but even for the sake of just imagery, we thought that he was a positive entity, even though I understand those others who understand the big picture. And I tend to agree with that big picture of he being a groomed individual that was set there for purposes. But even with him there, lessons were learned. We know that even behind president, behind your name, you were still the N-word to most white folks. So to me, that was one of the most important lessons learned <laughs> in his presidency. But back to I care. Uh, we're in a fight now today uh, because recently, well, about four, four years ago, school board uh, was granted a $1.2 billion with a B bond. It was supposed to hire black contractors and subcontractors, spend money with black businesses, elevate the black community because there would be more jobs because of this bond. To date, no one could tell you where the first $750 million went. And so we're fighting for some transparency. Uh, we're fighting this slick superintendent for making instant billionaires of folks in other communities and giving our community crumbs. Uh, they claim to have done business. They did a, a recent report where they claim to have done business with two or three black firms uh, that were on the list. And those black firms came forward and vehemently announced that no money came their way and no contracts were given to them. So we know that this superintendent, uh, Portuguese in, in origin, uh, has spent money earmarked toward our community uh, and continue to do so. His claim to fame, he became superintendent of the year a couple of years back. And his claim to fame was basically diverting Title I money uh, to other areas of concern. Title I money that was earmarked uh, toward the poorest of our communities. He has a formula now that states that he's created uh, a higher threshold to become a Title I uh, school, yet more schools have become Title I. So that doesn't make any sense. So we're on that tip demanding where the money is 
to stop using black people as a pawn to get a cash flow for you and your cronies. And basically the fight is about elevating inner city schools to be on par with all other schools throughout the district. Outstanding. <clears throat> I will post uh, your Twitter handle as well. I tweeted out the information for the broadcast this evening. Uh, so folks, if they want to follow or get additional information, that is a massive amount of money uh, to just have questions about what happened, where the dollar, I mean, massive, uh, if it's nearly a billion dollars, B billion dollars. I mean, wow. Um, if folks, again, have a question, last few minutes before we get ready to wrap things up, I'll check in with Firefighter again. But other folks, number 641-715-3640, code 564943, pound. Press star 61 if you would like to participate. I know one of the questions that a listener asked when we were talking previously about the uh, the current situation at the Miami-Dade County Fire Department. Uh, we talked to the uh, noose on the black firefighters uh, picture and the penises drawn on there. Some of the images, they put up photos of some of the officers that were fired. And some of the listeners said, I think, looking at the pictures and looking at the names, and said, I think some of these officers might be classified as uh, quote-unquote Latino or Hispanic, uh, and that these folks might not have the best views about black people either. Uh, do you have any views on that? Totally. I, I totally agree with that assessment. See, what we don't understand is that Miami is a hub for many different nationalities that come from various parts of the Caribbean, Central and South America, and in a lot of those countries. Uh, including Cuba and Argentina and places like that, there's a, a whitening of the populace that is going on. You can't even designate yourself as black, being black in some of those uh, countries. Uh, and there's racism abound in such places. And they bring th those attitudes here along with them. Some black uh, countries and people from black countries come with the same attitude. They've been sold uh, uh, some goods that say that African Americans are beneath them and try to teach, treat you as such. So it's not all European or white uh, ancestry that are giving us hell, but some of our own brothers from the diaspora think that they're better than us as well. We have to be educated, first of all, about the history of this country. Due to the fact that they outnumber their slave master on those islands, the punishment from the slave, as it wasn't as, you know, detailed as it is here. We called hell in this country. Willie Lynch the splitting of parts of the biggest bucks around, the raping of the biggest bucks around in front of his family and other black men so that you don't do the other thing, raping your women in front of you, chopping off your foot if you dare to escape. And the horrors were just massive. We don't even know how treacherous these people are among us. And what I would like to say is this experiment called America has failed. They almost had us with Obama now. They almost had us, this post-racial society that white people could vote this black man in and hope for the best. That soon turned very ugly, didn't it? Some of our liberal friends began to say he was uppity too smart for his own britches. And certainly that Trump factor and those individuals who were hiding behind that veil of white supremacy has now come full forward. And now they're, it's rearing his ugly head. And in a sense, I'm glad that it's rearing his ugly head. 
Because it's better to see them for what they are than to think that they're something that they're not. So white supremacy, the white supremacists, those about racists, you know, I'm glad that they're coming out, but they're not the most dangerous. <laughs> you got to deal with that closet racist, the one who don't speak up and speak out, the one who will stab you in the back and you don't even know it's him. We got a lot of those on the fire department and housed in these various companies as well. So be diligent. Keep your eyes and your ears open. And most importantly, stand up for your rights. No job is that important. I know we all need money to survive. But never, ever allow anyone to take your dignity in place of a job. It's not worth it. Never let it hit the ground. Start saying that on Thursdays, workplace racism might even invoke it tomorrow. Uh, never let it hit the ground, Mr. William D.C. Clark. Uh, retired firefighter, did you have a, a question or a comment you wanted to make sure you got? Oh, whoops, actually. Uh, hang on one second. Uh, the caller at uh, last four digits, 3637, did you have a question for Mr. Clark? Yes, I did. Can, may I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, Hello. Yes, thank you for coming on the show today, tonight. And I grew up in Waterloo, Iowa, so when you said you were you and I, I said, wow, right. that's amazing. Did, did you ever go to Waterloo? Lived in Waterloo. My girlfriend came from Waterloo. The best rib, uh, beef rib sandwich in the world from Waterloo. Uh, love that place, man. It was black people yeah. in the place. That's why I loved it so much, you know? Yes, exactly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I wanted to ask you, as a being a firefighter, are are young black men interested in being firefighters, do you find? Yes, I, I get calls monthly about them trying to become firefighters. I hook them up with the Progressive Firefighters Association uh, to learn the ropes and what they must do. But, again, uh you know, here in Miami, even those who are of us are indigenous to Miami, we'll still, you know, strife with the fact that out of every 36 applicants or a class of 36, there's only two or three blacks in the class. At that ratio, uh, we will never get ahead, if you will. But we try to encourage individuals to seek that profession. Uh, the benefits are, are great. The experiences are great. And hopefully those of us who have come through uh, that department have fought such a good fight that it's now a little bit easier. And let me correct you, brother. That's the scrotum on the head and the recent incident did not happen with Miami-Dade Fire Department. It happened with the city of Miami Fire Department. That's two different fire departments. So, yes, to answer your question, we do encourage uh, black males to uh, to join the ranks, and we do everything that we can uh, in our power to help them succeed. Well, thank you for coming on tonight. I'm really enjoying it. Thanks, Gus. All right. Appreciate thank you. It. Yes, ma'am. Appreciate that. Thank you for the correction, Mr. Clark. Um, Let's see the caller. At, oh, this is Roz. Roz, if you had a question for Mr. Clark, should be with us. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, greetings. Greetings to you, Gus. Um, uh, greetings to the firefighter in Florida and, of course, to the guest, Mr. Clark. It is so refreshing to hear such strong black self-respect um, just in your life. And I, I appreciate who you are, what you've done, and what you're continuing to do for our people. So I want to say that first. And I did have a question. Um, you said earlier that you experienced really horrible uh, racism at work, but yet you still had some people uh, on the job that were white that you did consider friends to some degree. And, um, but you did say if they had to take sides, you knew which side they would take, of course, the white side. So I was going to ask, I'll, I'll just put that out there. I think all white people are racist. I don't care how nice they are. I don't care what <laughs> they do to me. 
parents be still right. the room, if there's a newborn child or she's 90 years old, they're all racist to me. So I wanted to ask in your opinion, do you think that um, all white people are racist or and just have varying degrees to how they express their racism, meaning some are more refined than others? Or do you think that there's a such thing as a white person who is not racist? Thank you so much. Well, Please continue to do what you do for us. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'll mute my line. That's a great question, brother. I, I Just for the sake of it, I, I tend not to paint all people with a broad brush, but I do say this, that for those of them that don't exhibit racist tendencies, they do take advantage of white supremacy and its tenets whether they want to believe that or not. All whites uh, take, take advantage of white supremacy. All whites, whether they know that or not, that is the God honest truth. Is that sufficient, Ross? Absolutely. Um, thank you for answering my, my question. Uh, thank you for being on the program. Hopefully we can get you back again. I would love to just hear him and Firefighter in Florida together, especially since they know each other. I'm sure they have some stories that really help uh, victims even further understand the system of white supremacy. So thank you so much for all that you've done and all that you will do. Yes, and I will mute my line. Uh, thank you, brother. I appreciate the, the call. Appreciate that, Roz. Uh, retired firefighter, uh, if you had a question, comments you wanted to get in, uh, feel free. Yes, sir. I like I would like for Mr. Clark to uh, speak on two things, uh, his book and also his DCS program. Uh, the book uh, is a situation that I wrote in 1997, I believe it was. Uh, a lot of things were happening uh, in this area. Uh, to me, it was just a catharsis of some of the things that we were going through, the fire department in general. Uh, I didn't promote it as much because, to be perfectly honest, it wasn't edited properly, and I don't like to put things out that... Uh, that I don't think is top notch. I, I, I actually thought about going back and redoing the book. I'm getting ready to write uh, another book, to be honest with you. A uh, title, I haven't gotten that yet, but it was centered around about three or four, maybe about four or five individuals here in this area. And I think it's a good read. One such gentleman is uh, a brother by the name of Lonnie Lawrence, who happened to be uh, a friend of Arthur McDuffie. For those of you who, who know that name, he was a Marine who died at the hands of police, which caused massive riots in 1980. Lawrence happened to be a, a fellow Marine, Arthur McDuffie's best friend, but he, went, he, he actually rose to become the spokesman for the Miami-Dade Police Department. So one day he comes in and realized that he was, he's being asked to speak on behalf of this incident that took place. When he realized the incident was the death of a motorist at the hands of his fellow police officers, he asked what was the name of the guy who was killed? And the secretary said, McDuffie. And he said, who? He said, McDuffie. He said for a minute he didn't think anything about it because he knew it wasn't his guy, his friend. So when he asked what is the first name and she said Arthur McDuffie, he realized that he, as a the spokesperson for the Miami-Dade Police Department, was about to go to the podium and hold a press conference of some rabid, racist, white cops who stumped life out of his best friend's body and he was about to go up there and try to defend her. I thought that was just extraordinary to have a person be in that type of situation. So I'm writing a book uh, about such anecdotes 
and, uh, and, and center around some of the things that are happening uh, with the fire department, some of the things that we just talked about. Uh, as far as uh, the previous book, Letters from the Other Side, uh, it, I believe it's a good read. It talks about some of the things that me and Michael Imani and a few of us went through, my personal life, and a few other anecdotes. And I think he was still find it very interesting. Again, the book name is Lessons from the Other Side by William D.C. Clark. Uh, right now, what I'm currently doing is I'm embarked uh, in a mentoring group. I mentor young men from the ages of 8 to 18. Uh, we go through the typical take them to jail, boot camp, type of thing, but one of the things that we definitely do is reconnect them to their history, heritage, and culture, because we believe that our young men and women are like new Mercedes Benzes without the battery. And what happened to a car that's been disconnected uh, from their battery source for months and years? They soon become uh, disabled and unable to run. Well, our kids' battery source is their history, heritage, and culture. It reconnects them to their elders, their grandparents, their great-grandparents. So it's not about kings and queens in Africa. It's what happened during the Civil Rights Movement. It would happen, you know, World War I and Two. It would happen in this country, you know, over the past 50, 60 years. They don't know that much. So our job is to reconnect them to that battery source so that they can have a healthy respect for their history, heritage, and culture, a healthy respect for their parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents, and any other elder walking around here. One of the things that we do is uh, take them to uh, an elderly person or a disabled person home and have them cut their grass and paint their home. Why? Because it's you're giving back to the community. Most of our kids are entitled, and we have to uh, get rid of that sense of entitlement. You have to be a servant. We all have to be servants to our community. I just took them to a black restaurant as part of our uh, support business thing. And finally, we have a beautiful etiquette class that, that not only deals with using the proper utensils, but conflict resolution. What do you got a, you're on a date with a beautiful female and you're accosted by, you know, some gentleman who's, who's plugging at her. What will you do? How would you get out of that? All right. So we send them through these scenarios, but our mainstay is our history, uh, from the flashcards, from the videos. The first video I ever showed them was Emmett Till, someone of their own age group to give them that shock value and let them know this was happened in this country to people just like you. It awakens them very fast. And so we think we have a great thing going, and we will continue uh, to do what we need to do to bring these young men up to par. Appreciate the questions, uh, Mr. Imani. Hold on one second, because we had another person. Uh, Emmy, did you have a question for Mr. Clark? You should be with us as well. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Greetings. Um, thank you for uh, coming and speaking with us. Um, and I think that all of the things that you've just said are really fantastic, and um, I think that's awesome that these young non-white, specifically black males, have an older black male to show them things. Um, I think it's also very, like, I just, I was, this isn't what I was going to say, but because you said it right before I spoke, it was just like, that's cool. Um, the conflict resolution, like if you're out on a date, I've heard of many instances of black males being killed over just that, like not even any place great, like at Waffle House. Um, but right. anyway, right. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> You're right. The um, my question though, because I think oftentimes we kind of get um, polarized. So the belief that black women should work with black 
younger women and black males with black younger males and that kind of thing. But I think, too, that the young black females and black women in general, general um, suffer from the lack of black male presence. And I've been listening to you speak throughout the evening and um, not letting it hit the floor. I think, I mean, we've said that many times, and I think there's a lot of validity to that. Do you have any daughters? I have two beautiful daughters, yes. How, so here are my questions. Um, one, how do you teach your daughters not to let it hit the floor, drop the floor? Just because I think that males that tend, might tend to be a little bit more socialized to be more direct than females are. Yes. So how do you... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to... I give, it to I, give it, I, I, I give it to a straight with no chaser. I mean, she's a grown grown woman. I have a... I have two daughters, one much older than the, the one, uh, the younger one. This younger one just graduated from the University of uh, Central Florida uh, in finance. But she, it was an awakening to her, just as Northern Iowa was an awakening to me when I went to college back in the 70s. Central Florida was an awakening to her. She used to call her parents racist for talking about racism and white supremacy until she experienced it uh, in mass herself. Yeah, there were few instances here and there, but when she went to a predominantly white college like the University of Central Florida, oh, they were giving her the business from day one. She would call in tears. She would call concern. She would call just boo-hoo crying about, you know, incidents after incidences uh, uh, of what she just uh, experienced. And soon she be, became tougher. She began to hold her ground. Uh, she began to ask those per pertinent questions. Well, how do you deal with that? Things we never heard from her at a predominantly black high school, obviously. So she grew up quick. And because of that, she, she's that girl. She doesn't let anything hit the ground right now. She's more Afrocentric than we are right now. And it's, it, it was a metamorphosis uh, that came about before our very eyes. And it's a beautiful thing to see. Uh, we didn't pressure her. We didn't tell her to hate anybody. All we told her to do is to stand up for yourself. Because this is the real world. If you want to work in, in finance and business, this is what you're going to be up against. And she understood that, embraced it, and because of that, we have a very strong, uh, strong-minded young lady on our hands. Did you provide her any specific um, strategies for directly addressing racism in her environment? Well, I think having two parents that speak on the subject <laughs> almost every day, uh, you don't have to have, in our case, we didn't have to have a specific strategy other than to know who you are, embrace who you are, and stand up for who you are. Um, I believe uh, early on she tried to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Uh, we, since she was in business, we introduced her to Dr. Claude Anderson book and have her read that and read material that that pretty much she's interested in and, and, and involves what her current situation is all about. Hers happened to be finance. Hers happened to be business. We talked to her about the advent of racism in business. We showed her video clips introduced her to various books, and that coupled with her own experiences and the questions that she asked uh, worked for us. It may not work for anybody else, but it worked in this particular instance. And do you work with any young black females too? Yes, there's a, a, a sister group that we partner with. It's, it's called Girl Power, and I do like what you said about men and women intertwining with each other's group. 
I got several females come to us. I have one who teaches financial literacy, tell them how to take care of a, a checkbook, how to save some money when they get a job. I have another one who does teach the etiquette class and conflict resolution, everything from handshakes to various scenarios. So uh, we have women speakers all the time come in. I don't, it's not just a male oriented thing, even though the brunt of it is what we as black males should do and how to handle our business. But yes, we're open to working with women throughout the, the session. Okay. Well, thank you for answering my questions and enjoy your evening. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it, Emmy. Uh, retired firefighter, did you have anything else you wanted to get in with your colleague before we uh, let him enjoy the rest of his evening? Might have muted your line. Are you still with us, sir? Oh, I, I, had, I had to mute on. I forgot. Uh, I would say uh, that uh, years ago, uh, kind of like right after we started uh, the International African Movement, uh, we also uh, were met and joined by with some uh, uh, non-white black females who still have an organization uh, now. Uh, could you uh, tell uh, everybody about uh, the program that uh, Kiani uh, is still uh, having going on now, D.C.? Well, yeah, we're proud to have uh, partnered with a group called Concerned African Women. Uh, they were pretty much there from our start as we progressed as an international African movement. They joined us with the Malcolm X celebration in the park, with the Garvey celebrations in the park. We had a uh, Mandela uh, celebration. We almost had Mandela come to the park and the State Department uh, spoke to him, spoke against it. And uh, instead of him uh, stopping by the park with tens of thousands of people were there waiting for him uh, after Harry Belafonte uh, basically gave us his okay that he would be there, State Department told him it would be better that he went straight to the airport. But concerned African women have been there with us from every, every step of the way. They're still going strong. They've branched off a little bit, FEMA. Uh, it's now head of girl power. And again, as I told a young lady, we work with each other on such certain projects. Um, I'm about to end my session uh, with uh, purchasing suits for these young men and taking them to a, a five-star restaurant. We just took them to a black establishment wearing an Afrocentric shirt and hat to support them. So I'm trying to give them various facets of uh, reality here in the hood. And it seemed to be working. So we're open to uh, anyone or anything that can enhance us. We're open to other groups working side by side with us, which includes uh, other groups uh, uh, that has predominantly young ladies involved. Well, right on. Uh, again, our guest for the broadcast, uh, Mr. William D.C. Clark, 28 years uh, with the Miami-Dade County Fire Department. Uh, real pleasure to have you on the broadcast. Anything that you want to make sure you share with folks before we let you enjoy the rest of your evening? Yes, we can only do what we can do where we're at. Do what you can where you're at. Everybody wants to be a superstar. Everybody wants to be on the big screen. Everybody wants to be somebody that somebody else has idolized. That's not what it's all about. Let's get back to serving each other. But before we can do that, we have to respect ourselves and respect one another like we respect ourselves. You know, the greatest love of all is the love you have for yourself. And that goes with the greatest respect of all is the respect you have for yourself. Once you do that, you will easily learn how to love and respect any and everybody that looks just like you. This is a big problem in our community. We know we are suffering from self-hatred. Let's, uh, you know, put a little love in this with our young men, 
Sometimes all they need is a hug around their, their shoulders and say, and someone to tell them, hey, I'm depending on you. I'm depending on you to be great so that you could come and help me help others. Real simple. We, you know, when we were together as a people, uh, we were together as a people. <laughs> and I'll leave you with that. Don't let it hit the ground. We will be using that one from now on. I will make sure to give credit to our guest, Mr. William D.C. Clark. It has been a pleasure chatting with you. We will definitely have to have you uh, back on the program. I suspect there will be no shortage of incidents of white supremacy in the fire department. So uh, we will look forward to the next time we're able to have you on the broadcast. Yes, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Take excellent care. Enjoy your evening, sir. All right, you too. Thank you. Yes, sir. Context of white supremacy. Don't let it hit the ground. We'll be saying that tomorrow. Workplace racism, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Might even be a few tips that we uh, heard from here. If anything, I am for sure going to reference this here broadcast from now on. Uh, Any instances uh, of people talking about potlucks at work and uh, horsing around at work. Uh, I would much rather be thought of as being serious and too quiet as opposed to I go in and laugh it up and hearty har har har. And then I end up being tied and having genitals placed on my face. Hmm. No, thanks. No, thanks. I've said that consistently. Do not laugh or participate, even if they're joking about other people, even if they're not racist jokes. It could be a white person just telling jokes about another white person. I do not participate in any of that. I've got a lot of work to do and I'm going to be serious and going about my duties. Thank you kindly. (laughs) You can be courteous as you do and then not participating in the potlucks. Man, I am good forever uh, on eating anything in the workplace. And even sometimes in that environment, you don't know. I think uh, Mr. Clark said that towards the end uh, that. The more dangerous racists are the ones that are more refined, where they don't come out and call you all these racist names and everything so that you know up front, oh, okay, I got to be careful about that person. Man, you end up, you could easily end up in a work environment having people that they have a vendetta against you, or maybe they're just white supremacists and they want to do you some harm. You don't even think there's a problem. You don't even know that there's an issue. And then, oh, I, you know, stopped and brought bagels. Feel free to have one. Or I made this at home, you know, want you to have a little taste. No, thanks. And I would have those excuses read and that would just be a flat code. So it's not anything uh, where just this person just on the job, period. I'm good. (laughs) I don't need to eat anything. I don't want to eat anything. I don't care if you bay. You can let people know that up front that I have, you know, I have a real sensitive stomach. So I just don't do a whole lot of random eating. I don't even like eating out. That's what I would tell people too. I don't even like eating out. I have a very sensitive stomach. I had a lot of stomach issues growing up. If you need to embellish uh, as you need lactose intolerant, whatever it is. Uh, So yeah, I just do not, you know, do a whole lot of eating uh, of other people's foods. I've always been a real picky eater. And it'd be known for that uh, in the building. That'll squash that permanently and forever. Uh, As I said, we'll be here tomorrow. Workplace racism, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. We'll be here on Friday. The Wisdom of Psychopaths. Kevin Dutton, session number two. Wow. I was able to talk to Dr. Niana Rasayan. I said, wow, the timing, our the cows, our timing remains impeccable for us to be reading this here book and days after we start Charles Manson dies and the surge of attention on this white psychopath and he's mentioned in the book we've only read one chapter and he was talking about Charles Manson in the very first chapter uh, last week that we did oh cannot wait Uh, Friday 8 p.m. Eastern 5 p.m. Pacific compensatory call in uh, this coming Saturday and uh, we might have a white person on the program I'm waiting on his book his publisher is supposed to send it to me uh if they don't if i don't have the book by tomorrow we're not going to do the program because i won't have the book to prep so that i can you know ask questions uh so we'll just have to see how that unfolds one other thing that i did want to share and then i can check in briefly if folks have a comment they want to get in Uh, i was thinking today if the most powerful whites could have donald j trump elected president of the united states 
those same whites, they could have easily made sure that President Obama was never in the White House. And if they really wanted to be rid of him, they could have done that easily. If they can have Donald J. Trump, Donald J. Trump as president, it would have been the snap of the fingers to be rid of Obama at any time. That is total nonsense that whites suffered through the Obama years. That just thought about the absurdity uh, of that today as though they were held captive uh, for eight years by Negras and non-white people forming some sort of democratic uh, electoral block that just could not be defeated. Uh, that is, <laughs> anywho, uh, the only other comment I wanted to make sure to get in, there were issues with the iTunes feed last week. Uh, some of the programs had not updated there, even though I had uh, uploaded them. For whatever reason, they just weren't posting. Uh, they were uploaded on the other sites. They were uh, from last week, the compensatory call in and workplace racism. They were posted on SoundCloud. They were posted at Black Talk Radio Network. Uh, for whatever reason, they were just not posting at iTunes. All of that content updated, I think a day or two uh, ago, so all of it's there. Some of the other content, uh, it seemed just to be very intermittent, uh, like you would go to download. Sometimes it would be available, sometimes not. Uh, I just suspect all of that is white supremacist in, uh, interference. Uh, there's been so much of that over the years uh, and on a variety of different platforms. Stitcher not updating uh, in a timely manner. Sometimes iTunes not updating in a timely manner. Uh, it's been consistent uh, down through the years and just uh, problems. I think even one of our listeners called in over this past weekend on the compensatory call and said that, you know, he listens to a lot of podcasts on iTunes. The cows is the only one that he has difficulties consistently in accessing the content. That is the system of racism, white supremacy, and leads me to suspect that in all of my ignorance and stumblings, we could actually be falling more or less in a correct, accurate assessment of what the problem is. If we were really talking a lot of nonsense, I don't think it would have been years and years and years of interference. Uh, that's it. Folks that have a hand up, did anybody have commentary they wanted to make sure they get in? Uh, yes, greetings. Uh, I would just like to... Uh express uh, gratitude uh, for you uh, bringing on Mr. Clark and uh, just wanted to say uh, our each other meeting one another was based on uh, fighting against uh, attempting to fight against the system of racism white supremacy uh, uh, on on something that was that's called a uh, a uh, uh, a protest uh, where the union was uh, mistreating uh, its uh, non-white black uh, employees, uh, and uh, I think I may, I may have mentioned this once before a while while back on the program, and uh, we were marching with the placards and whatnot, that sort of thing, out in front of the union office, and just to show you how crafty racist white people are. Uh, they came out, a few of them came out very, very nicely and, and uh, asked, hey, any one of you guys, uh, cause it was very hot outside at the time, any one of you guys want to come in for some coffee and donuts? Uh, come on in. Come on in and have some. Everybody went, into, all of the non-white people went into the, uh, the union office except for myself, <laughs> William Clark, and the other person he mentioned, Ossie Nehemiah. And uh, uh, later on that evening, uh, they came to the house where I was staying. I was staying at my mother's house at the time. And we uh, organized uh, the International African Movement uh, together. And we've been uh, pretty close friends, almost like brothers for the past, well, actually since something like 1984. We've been uh, uh, around one another and uh, organizing and, and working uh, in that light, uh, with one another. And, uh, very, very grateful that you put him on the program and, uh, and, ex and expose what he's doing to a lot of other people. Thank you. Indeed. Indeed. Thanks for the recommendation. Hope it was constructive. The scrotomizing incident. I was reminded, I know you 
shared about, I think it was a colleague of yours, uh, where it almost sounded similar, where he apparently had been horsing around uh, with some of the white firefighters, and then they decided to do their own version of horsing around, which included, which included having genitalia placed on a black person's head or face area. Um, and like I said, they just wrote about this in the Miami newspaper with in connection to the recent incident at the Miami Fire Department uh, with the penises being drawn on the black person's uh, picture. I, that sort of thing. That's why I think black people should be talking about workplace racism. I mean, if this is happening, I mean, you've got decades of this behavior going on like everybody everybody who is black who is even thinking remotely about working at the fire department now you know they've been doing this scrotum thing for decades details this is what happened this is what i would recommend make sure you're not horsing around make sure you're not playing around having a code uh, i think that's the first and only time that i've heard some black people on a fire department or excuse me in a workplace setting say we need to develop a code about how we're going to respond and neutralize the racist attacks we're facing. I have never heard that that explicitly, but that is outstanding. And I guess if, if that's what you're dealing with, white people tying up people and placing their scrotum on your head, that would certainly motivate me to codify immediately. Yes, sir. Any other commentary folks needed to make sure they get in? Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I was so stunned by that. Not that I was so surprised that that could happen. I don't have that kind of disillusion or anything like that, but it reminded me so much of the high school in Richmond, or I think they said Henrico, but it's pretty much Richmond, where the white boys tied down the black players and simulated rape. And although, you know, it would be fantastic. Um, I'd be really curious to know, to be able to track that trauma in those individuals for the years to come. Like, I wonder, um, because he said something that made me think, he said, you know, and then, because I think that's actually how he segued into mentioning never letting it hit the ground. Or, um, I know I keep messing it up, but because, or not, you know, pretty much not taking it home. And they said that he had mentioned that that man was a family man. And so I'm thinking, you know, how does that affect you in your actual life? Because, yeah, it happened one time, and, of course, all the other little ones or whatever, but something like that. How does that affect you and how you relate to your wife or how you relate to other people, how you relate to yourself? And You know, no amount of money, in my opinion, really can do anything about that. That can only be processed through um, and even if you told yourself, you know, I'm over it, it is what it is, whatever, I don't believe that. Um, and so I would just, and of course, this is just hypothetical because there's not really any way for me to, you know, find out. But that's what it made me think because I keep thinking about those young boys because I haven't heard much about it. But that could be to my own negligence and laziness having not researched, you know, what's become of the boys or is there going to be a trial or anything coming up um, regarding that. But even still. How do they feel, you know? Um, but that's all I wanted to say, so thank you. Yeah, I thought that was important. I think that was the portion, too, where he had he mentioned the, uh, as a result of that trauma, you end up taking it home with you and, you know, having spousal abuse or abusing your children, that sort of thing, uh, as a result of that. Um, I cannot even, I cannot even imagine uh, the trauma that that would uh, produce uh, for a black person or anyone uh, having to deal with that sort of situation. And th as I said, they did include details uh, in the most recent incident uh, with the Miami Fire Department. Uh, the short paragraph, it reads, uh, and the, the incident that they are referring to here is the uh, penises that were drawn on the photograph with the noose. Uh, the incident is just the latest blemish for a fire department with a history of lewd pranks. They don't say racist. Infamously, rookies in the late 1980s were handcuffed while other firefighters sat on their face doing the perverse scrotum on the head, in quotes, hazing ritual. Four firefighters were fired, but reinstated after investigators determined that scrotomizing was an old department tradition 
the book that I thought of immediately, of course, The Delectable Negro, Human Consumption and Homoeroticism in U.S. Slave Culture. We read it at the beginning of the year. Excellent. And they said, they said tradition should white should be included. But this was an old department tradition. What does that say about a group of males who have made a tradition for years about putting their penis on another man? Any other comments folks need to get in? Folks satisfied? Yeah, I, I would say uh, briefly that uh, people like Charles Phillips and uh, the uh, generation of uh, black male firefighters that came before myself in D.C., uh, you know, briefed us on those incidents. And basically what uh, Mr. Clark was describing is that we, uh, myself and, and him and, and a few other guys, we actually kind of like uh, took things to another level uh, to whereas myself personally, we, we, we weren't always together either. Uh, for the most part, we, had, we, we were, you know, individually on our own at stations. And uh, I, I would I, I'm used to, to getting up in the morning with a with a game plan, like you said, codified. And I have that look on my face when I when I when I hit that door. And uh, I was will I was I was will, I was willing to actually uh, uh, somebody kill me in the process that I was not going to go through that type of thing. So they they basically left us alone on that on that level. They basically left us alone uh, individually. And then collectively, you know, it, it was, you know, I always appreciated, appreciated the idea before I got to a station, they already, they already was talking about me, you know, and, and I'm pretty sure the same thing was with him also. Uh, as far as that concerned, and for, for the most part, a lot of that, a lot of those shenanigans basically uh, uh, did not come to us. They came to, uh, unfortunately, they came to other non-white victims. Be serious on the job. Cannot stress that enough. Uh, be serious. Be serious. And that's one as well. I know people, you know, you can make your own conclusions about that. But if you find out that sort of information, man, <laughs> that might be a good time to share uh, with the other black people. You don't have to be in love with them. It's not saying that you got to go and have dinner or lunch together, but at least, you know, just pass on information that is of constructive value. Uh, they have a tendency to tie people up here and maybe put their penis on you might be something that you want to be weary of just you know something to think about uh, if other folks anybody else that we missed have commentary they want to share uh yes can i be heard yes sir uh yes uh great to see you guys i thought he was a great guest um just great information i love his black self-respect um I thought about that too when they said this is tradition and I'm just like, this is how they codify racist, rape, pedophilic, uh, diabolical, sexual deviant culture. And they call it horseplay. When I heard him um, discuss the whole um, scrotum, scrotumizing, <laughs> that's an interesting word, the scrotumizing in incident, I thought of um, the same thing, delectable Negro. And I thought about the section where he discussed the Toni Morrison book, where they had lined up the um, the black males and had the white males uh, ask them if they wanted breakfast. I thought of that part of the book, just that instead of them having a whole group of them, they had this one black male who indulged, sadly, in this sort of horseplay, if that's what you want to call it. I would call it ter sexual terrorism. And um, this did to him what similar something very similar to what happened to the guy in, in the book um, when we read it. And I was just, uh, let's just... Hey, I'm not surprised, but I'm just like, wow, um, just the fact that um, this, this black male thought it was okay to indulge in this stuff, and that's, that's exactly the type of behavior that white people will use to take license to do that, what they did to him, and even worse. Um, so, and I remember, it reminds me of a Dave Chappelle joke. I remember he did a, a, a gig in D.C., and he said the same thing. He said, never get drunk around white people because when you wake up, you'll have testicles on your forehead, you know, and people laugh. And I'm just like, if you know how real what he said is, like, you wouldn't be laughing because this is how they function. This is a great example. That's the, the um, story that Mr. Clark gave. Um, also, 
when you look at his experiences and even um the firefight in Florida when they, when he talks about his experiences as well ex- experiences as well since they both um have had pretty much almost identical experiences working together it just kind of reminds me of the Harvey Weinstein situation because now you have people that are supposed to be the most respectable white people Charlie Rose and all these other people coming out now being, um, you know, b- being discussed in this manner of using sexual terrorism throughout their entire careers. And to me, this is a great example of the fact that, you know, all white people are deviant, all white people are terrorists, all white people are racist. And even the white people that, that some black people, cause I hold none of them in high esteem, but some of us black people hold some of these white people in the highest esteem. And these people are way more terroristic and deviant even than the average everyday citizen that you hear about. Um, To me, the the stories he told, and when you just couple that with the sheer number of so-called respectable, affluent um, uh, white people that have come out, that this information has come out about, it's very symbiotic, and it should just really give us pause for thought with any white person. I don't care who they are, what their title is, what college they went to, um, how much money they donate to charities or give to non-white people. They are all the same, and all you need to do is give them enough time, and it will come out just like it's coming out now. Thank you. I'll mute my line. Absolutely. Context of white supremacy. What does it mean to be white? crystal clear and i would encourage folks like seriously that in terms of a field of study i think i've talked about before swimming pools that's a really interesting one that you can just kind of go back and uh, study the years uh, all the way up to the incident in mckinney texas uh, not that long ago where the young black female uh, teenager where she was thrown down uh, by an enforcement official race soldier uh, you can trace the whole history and learn a lot about racism same thing with the fire department uh, you can go back over years uh, and all across the country i think they had times where the firefighters uh, when they were exclusively white the firefighters where they would not put out houses uh, where they would not put out fires where black Black people resided. Uh, there were instances where black people's property uh, caught on fire. The fire department went to put it out and racists came out and poked holes uh, in the hoses so that they couldn't extinguish them. Uh, not hiring firefighters. I think that was a big incident down in Florida where they were saying that the black firefighters, they were just affirmative action hires and, you know, we need to get rid of them. Uh, just you can learn a lot about what it means to be white. System of racism, white supremacy, just studying the history of fire departments in this part of the world, even probably just in the area where you live, (laughs) whichever, you know, city or state that you're in probably has a very interesting history. If you live anywhere where they have a, you know, significant population of black people at all, I'm sure that that has come up in some way, shape, form uh, over the years. Uh, Just something that's interesting body of study. Anywho, uh, as I said, we'll be here tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, uh, workplace racism back to back days uh friday wisdom of psychopaths kevin dutton uh second installment and then the compensatory call in this saturday 9 p.m eastern 6 p.m pacific uh drop an email if you have uh, an issue as i said the archives have been uh at itunes specifically there has been a bit of an issue intermittently uh it works and then it doesn't uh just be patient. There are many other outlets uh, if you're looking for a specific episode where you can download or listen online, but uh, be patient. Hopefully it will be remedied shortly. Uh, with that, I will again encourage sobriety. Certainly, if war is being waged against us, and I mean, you've got all kinds of sexual deviance and chemical and biological warfare and everything else that you can imagine and probably even some things that we cannot even imagine, uh, it might behoove us to encourage, promote sobriety, protect our brain computers, our overall health uh, so that we can think clearly produce solutions, new, fresh concepts to help permanently solve the problem, white supremacy, 
racism. Certainly whites have done a lot to exploit, take advantage of us when we are intoxicated and not able to think at our best. We can remove remove that as an aid to racist man, racist woman, racist child, and save a few nickels just by being sober. If you're going to be out and about in a vehicle, especially this weekend, it's going to be a so-called holiday. You know the enforcement off, or maybe you don't know. Enforcement officers are going to be out uh, pretty heavy uh, this weekend, North America. I would definitely encourage being sober there and buckling up. Uh, you do not want some type of lame excuse to be the reason that you get pulled over. And we all know how that can escalate. Uh, let's do everything we can to minimize contact with race soldiers badge or no buckle up. Be sober if you're going to be in a vehicle driver or passenger. That said, creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Cow signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, What's brother. Your problem? You're a victim. Man, I'm a up. victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. <laughs>